हेलो ऑल वेलकम टू हाइपर लेजर इंडिया चैप्टर मीटअप सो टुडे वी हैव प्रेजेंटेशन अबाउट ओरिकल्स इन एंटरप्राइज ब्लॉकचेन सो जनरली ओरिकल ब्लॉक ब्लॉक ओरिकल इज अ ट्रस्टेड सोर्स ऑफ डाटा दैट फीड्स रियल वर्ल्ड इंफॉर्मेशन इन टू ब्लॉकचेन एंड जनरली वी हैव सीन द oracles in a public chain using chainlink but unfortunately there was a none of the hyperledger fabric based uh, oracles available so therefore we have spidra talking about how oracle is a service uh, designed to seamlessly integrate with permission blockchain so i welcome uh, ashwath goindan a co-founder of spidra and uh, prasan sundar velu to talk about oracle in enterprise blockchain especially in hyperledger fabric so over to you ashwath prasad um, thanks kamlesh and uh, <clears throat> thanks everyone for joining today's call um, so as kamlesh was mentioning right today's uh, topic is more focused on hyperledger fabric and how we have uh, you know implemented oracles Uh, which is to get the external data um, from trusted sources into into the blockchain during a contract execution um, or smart contract execution um, within hyperledger fabric and also you know another thing that we have done which is called as workflows which is all about um, uh, basically providing a no code way of writing smart contracts itself right um, <clears throat> so um myself uh, and prashant from my team who's the blockchain architect on our team will be uh, talking about these things um, so quickly about spidra what we do um, at a high level is that we basically provide a low code asset tokenization uh, solution for enterprise customers and businesses right uh, so we are more focused on the uh, private and uh, uh, permissioned blockchain space and providing asset tokenization solution for that in a very low code manner right and uh, across industries so we are not focused on just providing a solution for real estate for example or you know a specific industry as such but our solution is uh, is more you know generic and configurable to handle a lot of different use cases in different industries and that's our mission right to make the adoption of enterprise blockchain solutions um very easy by by in in tra traditional industries right where there are a lot of web2 solutions which are which are doing a lot of things like in supply chain insurance healthcare uh, banking finance etc right so while we were uh, developing this kind of a you know platform that can be used across different industries and scenarios right and that to a low code platform as such uh, some of the key requirements that we came up with right uh, to make this <clears throat> successful and easy to use um are are you know are some of these things that you see on the screen right like at the very core um, anybody who wants to do something with an enterprise or private blockchain network would need to set up a set up and manage an infrastructure right uh, the the whole blockchain network itself and that to infrastructure which spans across multiple uh, organizations uh, who may have their own way of doing things their own uh, infrastructure in different clouds on premises and what not so there has to be a way to easily set up that infrastructure across different participants <clears throat> then typically once you have that right um you would need to start writing chain code or basically smart contract in a general sense but chain code um, is what you write uh, it's what it's called in hyperledger fabric right where you have to write code within the hyperledger fabric blockchain environment now now um that definitely has a little bit of a learning curve for you know developers who are coming from traditional web2 systems right and who want to take advantage of blockchain systems so they need to understand how uh, peers orders and so on and so forth things work how how does authentication and signing work within uh, the hyperledger fabric environment uh, how do you write code effectively like for example a simple thing right like uh, you can't use the current time within within the chain code because the same chain code executes on multiple peers and they will all produce a different result for the current time when the code executes right and and then the transaction will not succeed because 
the output of the chain, the smart contract execution is not the same across different peers. So there are a lot of these kind of nuances, right? So somebody has to learn a new language and not necessarily a new language, but a new way of writing code uh, with even existing languages that they know about, right? So so that's the second thing that they would want to do. And that's where we, have, we as a company have done a lot of work to make that experience low code. And, you know, in order to do that, right, uh, what some of the things that we have done is we have provided a way for users to define different kinds of assets or objects on the chain. So in any use case, you might want to manage different kinds of objects on the chain, right? So think of it like a database, right, where you can create different tables and uh, um, and uh, basically manage different kinds of objects, right? Uh, <clears throat> but apart from managing the objects or assets on the chain, the real value comes out when you really can uh, implement some of the business rules within the, the blockchain itself, right, as a smart contract. Again, that would involve writing code, and that's where we have, again, come up with a workflow-based um, system with, with a uh, user interface using which somebody can actually design that entire workflow experience or, you know, uh, can, can basically author the rules within the blockchain without writing code. So I will delve into that. And then the other thing that as we I was all also saying was that, you know, typically you would need uh, data coming from various other places. So generally smart contract or whatever processing you want to do within the blockchain cannot just exist by in isolation, right? You would need some data like currency conversion data, for example, or, you know, GPS location data, uh, health, um, any, you know, insurance claims uh, related data, for example, any kind of data, right, that you might want to use while while you write smart contracts within the, within the system. So we have also provided a way to do that easily, which was not existent in the Hyperledger fabric space as such uh, to date. Um, so mostly the presentation will be focused on the uh, workflow part, which is the codifying business rules and the oracles part of it. But just to set the context, right? I'll just um, so that we all we all understand the overall context and uh, within which all of this is being discussed, right? So this is how the overall Spider platform looks like at the very base, right? Uh, we provide a way to set up the uh, infrastructure, the blockchain blockchain network itself among different organizations who could be on different clouds, AWS, Azure, or even on-premises, right? And we allow, we, we give a way to form a consortium uh, network uh, across different, uh, different uh, uh, infrastructure environments. Uh, then we provide uh, a lot of features on top of it. Of course, it's a, it's a hyperledger fabric network, which means that, you know, all the typical um, management of the network, like, you know, adding, removing nodes, channels, managing channels, uh, deploying chain code and interacting with them using a, you know, REST API. So all of those kind of things come out of the box. Of course, it's a managed network. So, you know, a lot of things under high availability, disaster recovery, uh, monitoring, you'll get health dashboard, so on and so forth, right? So all of that uh, literally comes out of the box. But then what we also provide is an asset tokenization application. And then connected with that, we provide on-chain on workflows and oracles and a few other features which, uh, which uh, we can look at. And of course, we provide an integration layer on top of it so that you know, the blockchain layer itself can be integrated into existing systems like SAP, Dynamics, or any of the ERP systems, Salesforce, so on and so forth, right? Or you know, with custom applications using REST APIs or integration with other uh, automation platforms like Zapier, Power Automate, and so on and so forth. Um, so I'll just, as I said, I'll just focus on the uh, workflows and Oracle part of it. So, uh, but before that, right, um, fundamentally, um, in any in, if you want to model any uh, scenario, right, on the blockchain, any business process per se, you would want to track some of the objects. Everything starts with, you know, tracking and tracing some of the objects, uh, the state of some of the objects literally on the chain, right? Um, so let's take an example, right? I'll, let me change to the actual uh, platform. So this is, this is the Spider platform, as I was saying, right? You can create networks uh, 
and uh, you can then add organizations or invite organizations to form a consortium, right? And then you can deploy applications. You can deploy your own custom built chain code or you know we, we provide an asset tokenization application which you can deploy that provides some of these functionalities out of the box so if i look at the settings in this asset tokenization application right the first thing that this provides is a way to define the different kinds of assets that you want to manage on the chain so this is a use case for uh, drug traceability in the pharmaceutical industry right so in in the in that use case some of the things that you would want to manage and to add on to the chain and track are things like the drug lots that are being manufactured right and then let's say the the drug then the drug lot is shipped to across the supply chain to uh, from by the manufacturer to distributors down the chain and then they are eventually sent to farm farm pharmacies and then they are sold to the customer right so there are different participants through which this entire as the assets uh, the assets are sent through and then there are other data like you know quality control reports associated with the drug lot uh, shipment information some iot data which which talks about you know when the drug is stored either in transit or in a storage location what is what was the temperature used uh, you know was it temperature controlled what kind of uh, uh, was it stored in the right manner during its entire life cycle, things like that, right? So these are different kinds of assets that you would want to, uh, in this case, right, or objects that you would want to manage on the chain. So you can create them like tables in a database, right? You can also define relationships uh, between different uh, assets, like in the case of quality control report, right? Uh, there's a field called batch number, which actually points to the drug lot uh, against which the quality control was quality control report was uh, created so it's like a foreign key relationship in a database right and you can also define the different permissions that that uh, different participants in the network have on these different assets for example the drug lot can only be created by the manufacturer while the others may have the permission to read it but they cannot create or update the drug lot uh, asset itself or object itself on the chain right um, so let's say you know uh, this is the these these assets have already been created on the chain and you know that these types have already been defined and you know the the corresponding participants in the supply chain the pharma supply chain are basically providing information about all, all of these different kinds of objects on the chain already right um, but that is just as I was saying right just uh, creating and updating assets and objects in the chain right in a in a easy manner but then what if I have I want to define some of those, these business rules, right? Like for example, in this case, right, one of the business rule could be that um, you know when a drug lot is manufactured, uh, there is a quality control uh, department or organization which does quality controls on it and provides a report. Uh, if the report uh, says that something has failed, right? Then I need to mark all of the drug lots that have been manufactured, uh, uh, you know, against which that quality control report was submitted. I want to mark all of them as defective and they should be sent for destruction, let's say, right? So, so basically when, when a quality control report says that these batches are not good, then they should not be processed for further, right? That I want to codify that business rule on the blockchain, right, within a smart contract. So these kind of things are what can actually be done by using the workflow engine that we have created. And I'll talk about how, how we have done that and uh, the technical implementation behind that. But before that, let me show you how that works, right? So this is the uh, workflow interface. So basically, if I create a new workflow, right, you can provide a name, first of all. And then once you provide a name, uh, so workflows have a concept of uh, a trigger and activities that can be performed. So trigger basically says, you know, when should this workflow be, the activities mentioned in this workflow be processed, right? So for example, the trigger in this case could be when an asset of type uh, QC report is created on the chain, right? So that is my uh, trigger here. Uh, there, there are different kinds of triggers like, you know, when, when an asset is created, when an asset is updated, deleted, uh, when an owner, ownership of an update is update, uh, is changed, uh, when approval, when an approval action happens. So we also have a, you know, rich 
way of managing approvals out of the box within the within the you know within the blockchain environment itself you know if everything happens in the uh, in the blockchain and in the ledger so you can basically say that for a particular action to be performed you need approval to happen and then there is a you know process for that so when when something is approved rejected then that could be a trigger right and oracle uh, prashant will talk about in in later slides but basically this is you know you are saying when should a workflow be triggered right so in this case we are saying when a qc report is created essentially that would mean that when a qc report is submitted to the chain right uh, then what can i do here right um so i can do quite a few things uh, i can start adding conditions when i say conditions it could be basically uh, if um, if condition or for each loop, uh, right? You can loop over multiple assets also. I'll, I'll tell you where it's meaningful. Uh, you can also um, read other assets from the chain. For example, right, when a quality control report is submitted, it has a batch number saying that this, this quality control report is for this batch of drugs. Now, now I want to get more information about that batch of drugs, like who was the manufacturer, when it was manufactured, when its expiry is there, what should be the you know, temperature within which it's maintained, so on and so forth, right? Let's say I want to get that information. So that's a different object on the chain, which is already there, right? So I can read an existing object from the chain by uh, providing its ID or, you know, um, I can read that information by uh, by providing a GraphQL query. So GraphQL is something that uh, we support um, generally also outside of the workflow. So you know, once you start adding, removing, uh, or managing assets on the chain, you can use GraphQL to query um, GraphQL API to query uh, any asset on the chain using any fields um, in the asset. For example, in, in our case, right, when I say asset, and let me just uh, show you some examples. Um, if I look at the data, right? Um, so in this particular, this is the same pharmaceutical supply chain use case, right? So if I look at the drug lot, right? So this is the, these are all the drug uh, lot related assets, which are already, which have already been added in the chain. Right. So if I look at this, there are a lot of columns, but if you see, this is basically just a uh, JSON structure. So you can actually bring in any JSON structure that you have. So any unstructured data literally can be put on the chain as a drug lot. The only thing is, you know, when you define the drug lot, you would have to say, what is the primary key, right? And that primary key should be one of the uh, fields in the JSON object that you're submitting. The rest, everything is fully, you know, flexible. You can submit any fields. You don't have to inform or, you know, configure in advance that what are the other different fields of a drug lot, for example. But the batch number should definitely be there because then going forward, you might want to retrieve the same drug lot back from the chain, right? So basically, it's a, you know, flexible JSON uh, object that you can, you can create and say, you know, this is a drug lot created on the chain using the REST API, yeah. Um, so basically, um, you know, using the GraphQL API, right? Now I can, be, if I look at this drug lot object, right? I can say that using the GraphQL, I can say that, okay, give me all the uh, all the drug lots whose shelf life is more than 24 months. Let's say that's, that's what I want to find out, right? So typically doing that, you can't directly do that against um against hyperledger fabric or any blockchain in, in that sense right you'll have to probably maintain this in an off-chain database and then query against the off-chain database but we have developed a graphql interface using which you can query and rest everything is managed by us you don't have to separately do anything to uh, to make that query happen so the reason i'm mentioning all of this is that because that graphql query can also be used within a workflow uh, workflow activity here, right? So I can say that get me all the, um, if there are multiple, uh, let's say the, the QC report has been created against multiple um, batches, right? So I want to find out all the all the batches uh, with those batch numbers. So I can use a GraphQL query for that and it will give you a ret return back a, um, a collection of drug lots from the chain. So everything is being retrieved from the chain or and whatever you do here, right? Everything is actually processed in the chain. And I'll tell you how, how that works 
from a technical implementation point of view, but this whole workflow actually executes on the chain. So it's not executing outside. Right. So basically, you can read uh, you read existing objects from the chain, and then the other thing that you can do is um, uh, perform a lot of actions. Like for example, right, you can update an existing asset. You can create and create a new asset. For example, right, if the quality control passes, right, I was talking about if the quality control fails, then I need to mark it as defective. But what if it passes? Maybe I want to create a shipment object automatically, a shipment asset automatically, right? So I can do that using this. Uh, you can update existing properties on existing assets. You can delete existing assets, re uh, request for approval, as I was saying, uh, raise events and, uh, you know, update owners, get external data. So quite a lot of actions that you can perform and on the chain, everything happens on the chain. The other thing is, you know, any any activity, like here you read something from the chain, right? The values that you retrieve from here can be used in a downstream activity. So everything that you read from any of these, um, any any data that comes out from any of these activity, activities, right, can be used in a subsequent activity. So that's how, you know, you can basically build out your entire sort of business rule without having to write any code, right? So let's let's take a quick look at an existing workflow that I've already created. Let me go back. So this is the same quality check uh, workflow that I was talking about, right? But this is already created on the chain. Uh, so this starts with when a QC report is created. Uh, what this is doing is it's checking the uh, packaging integrity. So if I look at a QC report here, there are uh, various kinds of analysis that are done, like, uh, you know, microbiological analysis, product condition, so on and so forth, right? And then there's something called as packaging integrity, right? So basically what this workflow, if condition is doing is from the input. So input is basically what, what triggered this workflow. So what triggered was creation of a QC report. So whatever was submitted in the QC report comes as an input into the chain. And if I look at this uh, data structure, data itself, right, basically it's a JSON object. And then within the data, you see that there's a field called packaging integrity, right? So that's what this workflow is looking at, input.data.packaging integrity. If it equals pass, then it's, it's a good lot. And as I was saying, we create a shipment object automatically. Uh, ship, and, you know, you can basically use variables from the input to do that. If it fails, right? Then what we are doing is we are basically uh, we are, we actually have a for loop, right? So in the for loop, it, it's looping over a batch number. So the the QC report can have one or more batches. So this QC report was, for example, submitted against more than one batch, right? So it's looping over the batch numbers, and then for each batch, it's checking, right? Um, so for each batch, what it's doing is that it's taking the current current item, which is a batch number that is being currently processed, currently processed, and it's updating the drug lot where the batch number is the current batch number status is being marked as defective, right? So basically, you know, it's finding all the looping over the each batch, and then it's going to find that batch drug lot on the chain and update the status of the drug lot to defective. So to see this in action, right, let's just uh, look at this. If I see the drug lot information here, right, and I take the first two, uh, first two lots, right, uh, their status right now is nothing, right? And my QC report, let's say, looks like this, right? Uh, there's a new inspection ID, and I'm saying these two batch numbers are being inspected, the top, top two, these two, right? And uh, the status of packaging integrities fail, right? And this is the QC report. So let me just quickly submit this QC report onto the chain. So you can use it through REST API, but there's a UI also using which you can do that as a JSON format, you can upload uh, using CSV and things like that, right? So when I do this, basically the QC report is now submitted as you can see. But then if you go back now to the drug lot and look at this here, you see that these two have been marked as defective now, right? Automatically, although I didn't, you know, say it, this needs to be updated. And if I look at the details, right, there's a history, 
so it was created some time ago, but it was updated just now, right? And if I view the details, it says that it, it was actually updated by workflow. So this is, you know, the history coming from the chain itself, but we enrich that with some data which we store additionally, right? So it's, it was updated by this workflow, uh, this particular activity within the workflow, and uh, it, it ran under the context of this organization, so on and so forth, right? And it was, the, the status was updated. So basically, you know, that's uh, that's how the workflow experience looks like, right? Um, and as I was saying, this this all actually gets executed on the chain, right? So let's look at how that actually works behind the scenes, right? Um, so this is the on-chain workflow that I was talking about, the different activities, there's, there's a concept of trigger, different activities, uh, conditions and loops, there are mat mathematical functions also that we support. Um, so how does the implementation look like behind the scenes, right? So when we are thinking about this very initially, right, the first question that came to our mind was, um, so this, this is literally code which has to execute on the chain, right? So one way of doing it is that based on the workflow, you, you generate the corresponding code dynamically and then deploy it on the chain, right? Um, that's a little bit complex process to do because first of all, you have to generate the corresponding actual, you know, Golang code, for example. And then the second thing is, you know, every time that happens, you have to now uh, do the entire chain code life cycle, right? Um, everyone, it has to be installed, it has to be approved, it has to be committed, all of that, right? So, so, so all of that has to be done. But the good thing with that is that that sort of fits in very well with the um, approval or endorsement policies kind of models within Hyperledger Fabric. So when you generally change the chain code, right, then you want some of the organizations to approve it. And then only, you know, a minimum set, depending upon the endorsement policies and so on and so forth. And then only it should be committed, right? So literally, if you think about whether you do it through a UI or otherwise, you are literally modifying the code in a way, right? And you're modifying the way the code is executing on the chain. So, so that, process, that process of approvals and all fits in very nicely uh, with the existing model if you, if you go via that route. The other way of doing it is it brings a lot of flexibility from a development and coding point of view, the way the the code is managed and all that you only have a static chain code, right? Which basically processes workflows, um, which has the capability to process any kind of workflow. So the so when you change the workflow, you don't have to deploy code again on the on the chain, right? Um, but the disadvantage of this is that you know you because when you're changing the workflow, you're changing the rules, which means that the similar kind of approval mechanism still has to exist somehow, right? Even though it's not, may not be existing at the Hyperledger base layer, but we have to somehow build it in and that too in a decentralized fashion, right? So everything, even that appro approval mechanism should somehow work on the blockchain side itself, right? Um, but that has to be somehow built in then. So we we did a lot of uh, thinking around this and we finally uh, nailed, uh, went with the static chain code model. So basically we have a fixed, we have a workflow chain code, think of it that way, which can process any of any workflow. And the way that works is that when a user creates a workflow from the UI, right? Um, the triggers, the activities, the workflow definition itself are all stored on the ledger. So this all goes into the blockchain, right? As objects which can be stored and tracked on the ledger. You can see the history of what was done. It's immutable. You know, everything that, that the ledger provides out of the box happens with the workflow definition and the corresponding objects also. Now, uh, who has permissions to do this and you know how um, whether how many organizations have to approve for a change to be made all of that is configurable so as i was saying right uh, we have an approval kind of mechanism which all which is already there so you can say that before something some some state change happens on the ledger uh, two or three out of five organizations need to approve let's say right so those kind of that approval mechanism we anyway had built in already not for this purpose but but for even simple purposes like if i want to change the ownership of an object right and that needs to be approved by more than one per, one organization then that kind of mechanism we already had so that that approval mechanism and the permission model we already we lay, layered on top of the 
workflow creation process, which means that whenever some change happens, uh, it can only be done by, you know, organizations that have permissions to do that, first of all, and then a certain number of organizations would need to approve that change also. But once that happens, right, this workflow definition itself is saved on the chain as a, as a JSON object or a series of JSON objects, right? Then when a method call happens, so as I was saying, right, we have the asset tokenization uh, application, which has some built inbuilt functionalities, right? Like uh, you can create assets. It provides a lot of those functionalities out of the box. So when one of those method call happens, which, which can trigger a workflow, like create asset, right? In our case. So when create asset happens, what the create asset method on the chain does is it sees, you know, if there are any workflows on which there is a trigger, which says that when create asset happens for the asset type that I'm going to create right now, should I, are there any workflows linked to it? So trigger evaluation happens for all the workflows. And then the list of applicable workflows is retrieved by the chain code from the ledger itself. So remember the workflows are also saved on the ledger itself. Um, so all of the applicable workflows are retrieved and for each workflow in scope, then um, the data of the asset that triggered the execution is put into a variable called dollar $input. So that you know the the entire data about that particular asset in our case the QC QC report right that object whatever was inside that the entire data uh, comes into the sort of pipeline uh, we call it pipeline but basically it's a place you know where we store all the variables that are uh, that are created created during execution of the workflow so so the entire uh, data of the asset that triggered that workflow comes into the pipeline as the dollar input variable and then each activity again is read from the chain and then those activities are invoked passing in this input variable and any output for it from any of those um, workflow activities are again um, added to the pipeline as a variable in this format so activity name dot output uh, variable and then the workflow execution continues uh, all the activities are executed and when all the workflows are executed then the all the changes made, state changes made to all the different objects that were affected during this processing are saved onto the chain. And then the, the method call exits. If an error occurs, then nothing is saved on the chain. So it's more of a transaction, right? So either everything is committed or nothing is committed onto the chain, which brings in that atomicity and in, in the entire workflow operation. Um, so I talked about variables. There are the, the input and output variables are definitely there. There are some in other inbuilt variables like you know current time. So current time is actually not current time because you know that that won't work as I was saying. It's basically the transaction time that comes out so that it's you know it's uh, it's the same across different peers when it executes. You can look at the current transaction ID. You can get the caller information like you know uh, whatever is the attributes in the certificate fundamentally you, using which the the transaction was signed, uh, so on and so forth. So there are some inbuilt variables that you can use also. Uh, we provide a lot of mathematical functions that you can use, um, addition, subtraction, multiplication, all the mathematical functions, some um, some functions around you know aggregations like max, min, average, some string concatenation, type casting, like you know, sometimes you want 10 to be an integer, sometimes you want 10 to be a string, for example, right? So type casting. Um, so pretty much all of this. Think of it like you know programming, but without actually writing code, right? So whatever is required to do that in an extensive manner uh, and configurable manner, we we provide all of that. Um, some interesting things, you know, workflows can trigger other workflows. For example, right? Um, in in our in our in the use case that I was talking about, when a QC report is submitted and it 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 uh, everything is okay, you create a shipment object. There might be another workflow which says that when a shipment object is created, do something else. So, you know, workflow will can so the creation of a shipment object in this case can trigger another workflow which can do something else also, right? And sometimes you might want to do that. Sometimes you might not want to do that for an automatically created action. So that behavior can be controlled. Uh, permission checks are enforced, you know, even when workflow creates or manipulates other objects, but you can again tweak that behavior based on whether you want to do that or not. So a lot of different, you know, functionalities basically to, to cater to any use case, literally, that you can program without actually writing code, right? So that's fundamentally the, um, the feature of workflow and what it actually does. 
Um, now I'll hand it over to uh, Prashant, who can talk about oracles and you know what they do and how it's helpful in the overall process. Uh, Prashant, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Ashut. Um, yeah, let me share my screen. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Prashant. I'm a blockchain architect at Spydra. So in this session, I would like to uh, talk about our uh, recently released features in Spectra, right? That is Oracles. So I'd like to give a general idea of Oracle, and then I will explain how we can create Oracles in Spectra and use it in uh, you know our workflow uh, feature, which I should just explain. And as well as you know, in Spectra we can upload our custom chain codes as well. Like if you don't want to use the workflows and if you want to uh, use more complex logics you can write uh, your own chain code you know i plus go using golang or nodejs and you can also use that to uh, de be deployed in the network that is created with spidra right so oracles can also be used there the oracle feature that spidra has right so i'll explain all these stuff so basically to give a general idea uh, an oracle is an interface that allows smart contracts to retrieve external world, world data into the chain code itself and process it, right? Uh, so why, uh, so, so we know that Hyperledger Fabric allows some of the most commonly used languages for chain code writing, right? Like uh, Golang can be used, Node.js can be used. Uh, making HTTP requests directly from the chain code using those languages is easy. But why do we need a special system or special functionality like Oracle, right? Uh, the reason being, uh, when we write a smart contract, it must be deterministic. So uh, to take an example, when a transaction is initiated uh, in Hyperledger Fabric, it is executed by all of the peers in the network, right? The, uh, the chain code itself will be executed by all of the peers in the blockchain network, and they will produce individual outputs. In the end, uh, the consensus algorithm actually checks all these outputs individually, and only if they match, the transaction will result in um, you know success. Otherwise, the transaction will fail. When we think about introducing HTTP request calls in chain codes directly, it can lead to non-determinism, right? Because we, so we are essentially hitting third-party APIs. We don't have full control over that API. And uh, uh, when peers make requests, individual peers make individual requests and the responses can be different. So in the end, it, be, it can become non-deterministic, right? So that is one reason. Another reason, Usually when talking to these external ser uh, services, we would need API keys, right? And uh, if it is a single external data source, right? If, we, if the logic depends on single external service to fetch the data and using that data alone, we do the logic, then it would be easier. Uh, actually, it, it is possible with uh, already existing chain code logic itself we can actually pass the API keys in the transient map of a transaction in Hyperledger Fabric, right? Essentially, this transient map won't be stored anywhere in the blockchain. So we can uh, safely pass the API keys in the transaction itself. But imagine if, let's say, so we have a decentralized network, right? Uh, one organization does not trust another organization. And let's say one organization is preferring data from one service provider and another organization does not like the provider. They want to configure their own service provider for, for fetching the same data, essentially, right? If that kind of a situation exists, uh, when the transaction is initiated, it is initiated by a single organization, right? They can pass their API keys, which they have access to their service, their uh, external service, but they wouldn't have other organizations' APIs, API keys as well. So it is a problem, right? So the, So Oracle, essentially is designed to solve these problems, right? In um, Spidra, so I'll just talk about how we can create oracles 
Inspired Draw. Inspired Draw, we can uh, define any external HTTP API as a data source, right? If you want to uh, take from a public weather API uh, and use the data in the chain code, we can do that. We can configure Oracle with that. And uh, we can embed Oracle in workflows as well as in custom, custom chain codes, right? We, we have added those features as well. Apart from that, so we have been talking about taking data on demand from the chain code, right? But there is another feature that we provide where if you want to, on a certain frequency, monitor a certain API data and load those data onto the blockchain, right? For example, if we, uh, if you want to load currency rates, currency conversion rates from a third party API onto the blockchain every one hour, right? To monitor that and uh, save it in blockchain. We can do that with, with Oracle schedules. Uh, that is also another feature that we are providing. So I'll basically explain that as well. And uh, we, so right now in Spider, we, we only allow defining one external source per Oracle, right? But uh, uh, in future, we are also planning to um, support configuring multiple external sources like the like the use case that I just touched, right? Where one organization may be preferring one uh, um, API provider and another may be preferring another API provider. In such case, uh, in future, we will support configuring multiple external um, uh, HTTP APIs, right? And these, once these results are gathered, they can be aggregated and used into the blockchain. We can say conditions like, um, we can just say that all of these data has to match. That can be one condition. Or we can say that this data has to be in certain range to be able to use in the uh, smart contract, otherwise the transaction should fail. So we can aggregate and we can use any sort of conditions when we are taking these different data, right? Or rather, if we, if we are not thinking about um, different organizations' preference, we can just simply say that we don't trust a single service provider, right? We want to collectively take data from multiple providers to make the data coming from outside more reliable, right? That's the, in a, in a way that that will be uh, the point of Oracle itself, right? So uh, let me uh, jump on to a quick demo. Um, I I have created um, a network already in Spider. So this is my network. And uh, I have deployed an application also using asset tokenization chain code itself. I have a crop insurance app application. Right. So in this, I have defined uh, three assets. Right. One is the application itself. If the insurer wants to apply for a claim, they can do that. And if the application is success uh, successfully up approved, then it will come onto the approved asset. Right. Uh, a new approved asset will be created. And I also have another. Um, assert with which I'm going to uh, monitor the bad weather events. So I'm basically going to use Oracle schedules to monitor whether uh, the weather is bad and I'm going to log it on blockchain, right? So for, for the uh, application, this is the data structure that I'm going to use. So I'll have an ID, uh, I have a name, region, other number, incident, uh, incident code and climb amount, right? In this, uh, this region is an important. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to create a workflow, right? When creating this asset, this is an application, right? This is basically an application saying, uh, I need to climb 50,000 rupees because uh, there has been an excessive wind. Uh, weather, weather has been bad, so I lost some crops, so I need to claim some amount. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write workflows that would look into this structure. And when this structure is created, it will 
automatically approved based on a condition. So I'm going to actually look into the weather data using an external API. And if the weather is actually really bad in that region, then I would approve. So the, the smart contract will approve the application automatically and it will go into the approved status. But if the weather isn't bad, right, then the claim will be automatically rejected. That is the idea that I'm planning to, right? So for that, first, let me go ahead and create an Oracle. First thing is I have to configure an Oracle, right? Uh, so I already have one Oracle. So let me just showcase you how to create one. Let's say I, I need, uh, so the name of the Oracle is Weather API, right? And I have selected the channel, Hypology channel and my organization. Then in the Oracle configuration page, I can uh, give the URL and other details of the API itself, right? So I uh, I have looked into this uh, public weather API. Uh, so I'll be using this to fetch data. So I'll just quickly explain what is there in my API, right? This API. Uh, this is the URL and it accepts a queue parameter as a query parameter, which takes the region on which you want to check the weather details, right? And apart from that, in the headers, I can see I have two headers. One is the API key itself, and another is some host information, right? If I send a request with this, I'm getting this sort of a structure, this sort of data, where in the current field, I have temperatures, uh, wind, uh, general condition, etc. right? So I'm going to make use of this data. So to configure this, I'll head back to the Oracle section and on the URL section, uh, I will copy this URL, right? This is my URL. This is going to be my get request. It's not post. So in this case, it is a get request. And uh, in the params, uh, we can configure any of these params, right? In my case, it's a query param, but uh, it can also be a path param where you can say, you know, something like, uh, something like uh, url slash item slash 123 so this sort of url is also there right this is called uh, path parameters that can also be configured uh, other than that uh, you can also send uh, in the request body or you can send nothing right in my case it's a query param so i'll select query and in the authentication methods uh, you can do basic authentication which is username and password sort of an authentic authentication if the api supports that in my case, my API does not support that. I, I, I'm going to use a custom authentication where I can add custom authentication headers, uh, right? So I need to add X API key here, X rapid API key. And my actual API key. And I can, uh, so I need another header also, right? So I will and the X rapid API hosts, and this is my value. Right. So these are authentication headers, but if you just want to add other regular headers, right, you can also uh, add something like uh, accept, accept en encoding based or whatever, right? Uh, let's say I need an accept header and I just give star slash star uh, we can also do that the difference between authentication headers and custom headers is that whatever we configure in authentication headers is going to be securely stored in uh, uh, key management systems uh, so whatever cloud we are using in this case i'm using aws so these values are stored in uh, aws uh, key management system like secret manager so this way uh, you know, we are also storing these uh, things securely. But if you are giving in custom headers, it is just going to go into the data as it is, right? It's not going to be used in Secret Manager. When I continue on the next page, we can configure a scheduler, right? I'm not going to create a scheduler right now. Uh, let me first showcase how a regular request works. Then we can come here and configure a scheduler, right? Then on the next page, you can see uh, we can review this and submit. Once submitted, 
<clears throat> we can see my another oracle is also here so this is my second oracle but when creating the first oracle in the network or in the channel uh spider will actually deploy an oracle chain code in the background so since i have already created a first oracle yesterday the oracle chain code is already here uh, live running right uh, so whatever oracle we are configuring is also going on to the chain right it's not just stored in the database but it's actually stored in oracle chain code so that uh, gives a sense of security uh, you know since we are dealing with blockchain okay now i have configured my oracle let me create the workflow that i just talked about right i will go on to my insurance app again and i will go on to workflow section here i have already created two workflows so first i will talk about the insurance approval workflow so <clears throat> that is the case i have talked uh, let me create the same workflow again to just showcase how to actually create the workflow right to to get into some of the details right i am giving the name of the workflow give description uh, if i want i just created so first thing we have to define in the workflow is uh, creating a trigger in my case i said that if an application asset is created then smart contract should check for the oracle check for the condition and uh, only if the condition satisfies i will create the asset right so that is the workflow i am going to follow i am going to add the trigger as on create asset right and my asset type is application so i'm saying when application is created then i'm going to do the following to create some workflows right uh, so the first step that i want to add is an action right i'm going to get external data so in the actions ashwat may have defined there are a lot of different actions right uh, one of the actions is get external data which is oracle and if you do that you can name your blocks action blocks anything you want in this case it automatically took and uh, i have to select oracle right i will um so i will select this api which i uh, which this oracle which uh, i just created right and you can see the source url is mentioned here and param type is query uh, so now when uh, when in your chain code logic if you want to send the request to this um, api to fetch the data what parameter do you want to give what is the q value that you want to give right uh, we need to take the region region either we can give constant values like this right or in my case i know the exact structure that i have in my in my application asset right in my application asset itself i am asking for a region so i will use this region and look the weather on this particular region right so to do that i'll use this syntax put dot data dot uh, region i notice whenever i'm reading some fields from the asset i have to use a dot data in between so because in the back end how it generally works is we have a generic chain code right so we store it in a wrapper structure and the actual data that we put in the asset goes into the data field so whenever we are using an asset whether it is reading or whether it is creating we have to use dot data whether it is output or input but we have to use dot data then followed by our actual asset fields right that is what i am doing here so i will update so i just created a step that is going to take data from the oracle once the data is taken i want to add a condition right i will say if, um, if so i am going to have a if condition if temperature is yes so when the when the data is received from the oracle the workflow will have access to this data right and what i'm going to do is i'm going to particularly particularly check on the temp underscore c field which is the temperature celsius and if the temperature is less than a certain amount i'm going to approve it so 
it's a simple logic basically i'm saying it's cold so probably it's raining so i will do that right that's what i'm doing i'm saying on if condition if uh i need to use the data from the oracle right now right in input if i use input i can access the data that is coming in the input which is the uh, application data right but this time around i want to use the oracle's data so i have given the uh, i have given name for the oracle right which is get external data one i can access data from that block by this syntax basically i have to define the name of the block external data one dot in this case i can directly oh okay so this action block will send an output actually right so i have to use output dot then in this case directly refer to the fields so it's current dot temp c send temp underscore c right so this is how i can access the data that is coming from oracle and i'm i have to check that it is less than uh let's say 34 because 33 is coming right now in China. okay let's say even higher number to make sure that it works right okay let me just refer to the get external oh sorry this is the main problem okay temperature um, get with the data dot output dot current Okay, I think the name had some issue, right? Okay, I was able to create it, right? Then if the temperature is less from the data that we have received from the Oracle, what do you want to do? If the condition is true, um, instead of ending, okay, I don't want to end. So I want to actually create another asset. Right, I will add another action saying I want to create another asset, create approval, which is approval, approved, right? Basically, I'm saying if the condition is less, then I'm just going to create the approved asset for this particular uh, application, right? The approved asset structure that I'm planning to give is this, right? It is going to have its <clears throat> own ID. Then what is the application ID and what is the approved amount and what is the reason, right? For approved assets, its own ID, I can use auto ID. This is a variable that we support to automatically populate. And but apart from that, uh, we can we can give other application ID and, and, and so on. So we can define the structure basically, right? Uh, for the sake of time, I will just move on to the uh, workflow that I've already created and I explained with that. So basically I've created the same thing here, right? ID I'm taking from auto ID and application ID ID I'm taking from the assets data ID, right? In the application asset, I have the ID. I'm referring to that ID here and approved amount also I'm taking the full amount from application and I'm giving a reason, right? Then if the condition fails, then I'm just saying it is going to fail 